It's really great when technology works good, just so you know. I love technology when it works. Uh, but if you have your Bibles, be turning to John chapter 12, where we open service today, and that, that's where we're going to be preaching from. And we're going to be talking about divine direction. But this morning, I want to bring up two things. I said two things before we get started. <clears throat> Both of them are going to seem irrelevant to some of you, but because we do have people who, who listen uh, to our messages, I don't ever want to be uh, negligent in talking about things that need to be talked about. I understand something. Uh, I feel like I'm probably talking to a room full of believers, those who believe but nothing else what I say most of the time, believe the Word of God. Uh, but as I speak to believers, as I speak to Christians, I want to remind you that, that as Christians, we are called to be good citizens. All right. For those of you who don't know, who are just so disconnected, we have entered into an election year. All right. For all of you who have not registered to vote, I want to encourage you, Amen. implore you, Amen. go register to vote. And then when it's time to vote, vote. Amen. Now, now for the for the. For the Franks in my life out there who will tell me over and over again that, you know what, man, I just don't see any reason. It's just one vote. That's right. That's one vote that's not counted if you don't cast it. You need to join yourself with people of like mind, like values, and, and do your part as a citizen. That's all I'm going to say. And for those of you who, who frustrate and say, man, well, you know, look, I just believe that we just had term limits. This, let me tell you something. We have term limits. They're called primaries. If you don't like who's on the ticket, get somebody else on there. Amen. Huh? Amen. So anyway, that's, that's number one. That's my encouragement to you today. Number two, I want to tell you, all I'm starting to think the Christian world's gone crazy. I don't watch a lot of Christian television. I told you, I don't listen to a lot of Christian radio other than music. But I, I, I was sitting there, and, and I've just had one of those weeks where I hadn't felt good, my brain hadn't worked real good, just frustrated about different things, irritated about certain things, people mostly, but I don't want to get into that. So I'm sitting there on the bed, and I'm relaxing, and, and, and I said, man, let me, just, let me just go to the guide. I'm going to go to the Christian network. I'm going to see what's on. And I saw one, I recognized the name. I was like, well, man, I ain't heard him in years. Have it. The last time I actually laid eyes on him, he, he was doing a podcast because he'd been battling cancer. And I thought to myself then, when I saw the podcast, he had a beard down to here. And I ain't got anything against beards. But I thought to myself, self, he's got that beard because he's been at home battling cancer. And I'm thinking to myself, Lord, help him. Lord, Lord help this man. I, I hope he gets over the cancer. I hope you heal him in Jesus' name. You know what I'm talking about. But this is the same guy, though, when I turned it, that's been a couple of years removed, and I flip it over there, and my Lord, this probably fixing to be 60-year-old man, if not already, Pentecostal, holding his background, has started, I don't remember how many churches and storefronts until finally he got one that took, and it took off, and they've been around for 30 years. And I was plum embarrassed. Look, and I'm not being critical. Please, please don't misunderstand. Because I have come to realize, number one, I don't, I've probably never been cool. Never been hip, depending on the word. You know what I'm saying? Depending on whose definition we're talking about. But I can go ahead and tell you right now, I'm, I'm definitely not hip today. Huh? I'm getting old and honored. Don't appreciate some of these young, the, 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 the younger generation's attitude about certain things. What I'm getting up to is, is it, it was plumb embarrassing when I saw the man preaching and he had on a t-shirt that said something on it that didn't have nothing to do with church. And he had a, he had a blazer of some sort on with a with the the cuff rolled up to here, blue jeans and a pair of flip-flops. I said, "Who are you trying to uh, attract with that old man? You look like an old man trying to look like a kid." So I'm thinking to myself, this is a man who 10 years ago would have never stepped on a, on a pulpit or a stage without a three-piece suit. I want to know where that went. You go, all right, now, th those of you who are looking at me going, where's your three-piece suit? Ain't never, ain't never ever really owned one. This is what you get, man. I ain't never tried to put on for none of you. This is it. You go, well, what are you doing up there with no shoes on? Because this is like being at home, and I don't wear shoes at home. Huh? 
My feet hurt when I put on dress shoes. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, if you see me in dress shoes, it's because it's required or expected. But what I'm telling you is the church has gone crazy trying to cater to people that don't care. Let me tell you something. If it takes that, that uh, being hip or, or being whatever, man, to draw people so you can pat them on the back and tickle their ears, we have a serious, serious problem. Everybody follow what I'm saying? What, what I'm trying to tell you is you need to be praying for the body of Christ. I was wondering to myself, because I, I remember a preacher I used to listen to regularly, he said, you know, uh, the, the reason he didn't mind certain things in church is because, you know, the Apostle Paul would come into churches and, and wouldn't even recognize it. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. The Apostle Paul wouldn't walk in our church and recognize this as a church service. You know why? Because he was never a part of church services. The Apostle Paul would come in here and damn all of us with his words. What are you telling? What are you saying? How can y'all call yourselves Christians? And you have all this liberty and do nothing with it. The Apostle Paul would probably not really appreciate what we do and call church. And with that said, I, I hope I've encouraged this morning already because it's probably not going to get any better. Amen. I mean, it's just the Word of God. Okay, everybody follow where I'm going. That's, that's all I really want to do is preach the Word. And that's where we're going to be this morning. Divine direction. Uh, John chapter 12, starting in verse 44, says, And Jesus cried and said, First of all, go ahead and mark it down. We're going to be studying from the words in red today. So you don't get mad at me. If you don't like it, you, you take it up with Jesus. Okay? But he says, he that believes on me believes not on me, but him that sent me. And he that sees me sees him that sent me. I come, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believes on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejects me and receives not my words hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Lord, help us to. See, as we've been talking for the past few weeks, uh, this, this is a big long uh, discourse. It is actually a big long section of scripture probably happened during a, a very short period of time. It's all compressed. Remember, we're in the last, last days of Jesus' earthly life. His, his earthly ministry is fixing to come to a close. You see, and what it is is, is Jesus is giving his last public discourse. After this week, we finish today, Lord willing, everything now either turns to the disciples or private conversations. So this being the last public discourse, Jesus has been doing something that all us preachers attempt to do, and that is he has been weaving in these uh, subtle appeals to everyone who is listening. You know, when you're, when you're talking to somebody and, and you start telling them about Jesus, tell them about the Word of God. And, and, and I'll go ahead and tell you, this is what I, I try my best to follow Jesus' example and appeal to them to make a choice. Appeal to them to believe. Appeal to them to, to study and make sure that what I'm telling them is the truth. You see, what Jesus has been doing is, remember it in Matthew chapter 24, he starts laying out details of the end time events. And, and he, he begins to, to warn the, the people that there's coming a day that this direct man-to-man -man incarnation, revelation of Christ will be gone. You know, th those people had a, a, a time and something that we would long to have, and that is this physical relationship with Jesus. We often have people who tell us, you know, man, if I could just see him one time, that would make all the difference in the world. And of course, I always remind them, no, it wouldn't. 
And they go, why? It says, because Jesus said in his last discourse to the public that the light is going away and y'all are going to look and not be able to find because you walk in darkness. But you choose darkness. And you will not see. Even if he were to come up, tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, I'm Jesus. Would you like to believe in me? Most people would turn their backs on Jesus. Sorry to say. So he has been reminding him that this special revelation is what I'm going to call it, is soon going away. You see, there are many there who saw him. There are many there who heard him, experienced him. And guess what? They will be left dull and dim. They will be left unsaved, but not unwarned. Understand something. There are many people that are living today that will leave this earth unsaved, but not unwarned. See, many will recall. <coughs> many of Jesus' listeners that day will recall the voice from heaven that they heard. And they'll go, you know, well, we think it was a voice. We, we well... It really sounded like thunder. And, you know, honestly, I know Jesus made a lot of claims, and he was an awesome teacher, and he preached real good, and he was a miracle worker, but that was probably nothing more than just some, you know, nothing more than just some angels. No big deal. Right? You see what it is? is they're, just like, they're just like many today who have the the voice of the Spirit of God come knocking on their hearts through the Word of God and they remain unmoved and unsaved. You see, Jesus makes the appeal to take hold of the truth that He is the light. At the end of the day, that is somewhere that, that we should walk. I don't walk in, quote unquote, enlightenment. I walk in the light of Jesus Christ. In John 8, 12, these are repetitive scriptures. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. If I am following Jesus, especially if I'm following him closely, my path is guaranteed to be illuminated. What gets in the way a lot of time, though, is our pride and our ambitions and our wants and our desires. And what it is is we're following Jesus. Jesus is going this way, and we're, and we're following like this. Huh? Y'all see that? Now, let me show you again what I'm talking about. Jesus is headed this way. His light is illuminating the path. And you're following like this. You're looking at your way and you're trying your best to follow Jesus. You don't understand why there's no light on your path because you're not following His path. Amen. I can't understand why, why some folks do this and, and, and why some ministries seem to flourish. Well, some ministries really aren't flourishing at all. They're just following a marketing plan. They're following, following a business plan that works on all levels. But if they follow it long enough, they're going to follow like one of the major Protestant denominations in our country. They'll turn their back on the true gospel Amen. and they'll die. See, you need to turn to the front because Jesus said, he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the king. You need to get your mind off of all this other junk. It really doesn't matter anyway. Huh? And follow Jesus. I said, follow Jesus. I said, get in the word of God, read those red words, and, and do what he says. See, I don't want, I, I told you before, as much as I love WWJG, what, JD, what would Jesus do? That is of no consequence for, to me as much as I want to know what did Jesus say to do. Amen. You get me there, and I'm going to be just fine. You see, because in John 9, 5, he says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world, which, which is telling us that there's coming a day when Jesus would not physically be in this world, but he was not going to leave the world without light. Remember, it was just a couple weeks ago, we, we read in John chapter 12, uh, verse 35, it says, then Jesus said unto them, yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. And he that walks in darkness knows not where he goes. If you are walking in darkness, you're lost. 
If you talk to a person who even claims to be a Christian and you say, look, uh, if you die today, when you go to heaven? And they go, I'm not sure. They're in darkness. You see, when I got saved, and, and when I, especially when the Lord has really got a grip on my heart, you ask me that, I don't hesitate. It has to be the Spirit of God as I'm going to heaven, not because of anything I've done, but because of everything that Jesus has done. You see, what you must understand is that Jesus, whether while he was on earth or through his church, the body of Christ today, is the illuminating presence of God on this earth. There is no other light source on this planet that matters. It is only Jesus. So, so today's message where I've told you it's going to be divine direction, I could, talk, I could call it divine order if I wanted to. Because Jesus now begins to lay out the divine direction of his ministry. He's been preaching for three and a half years. He has been preaching, doing miracles. He's been walking this earth with, with disciples. He has had crowds following him. And many people, as dim and as dull as we can be, look at him and go, I, I still don't get it, Jesus. So Jesus makes an appeal. He says... He that believes on me believes not on me, but him that sent me. And he that seeth me sees him that sent me. He, he's, trying to, he's trying to open your eyes to the fact that he has a Father in heaven who he has not only come to earth to represent, but he has come to be God on earth. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and rattle your cage a little bit this morning because I'm going to leave you... Uh, Thinking for yourself. You see, as a Trinitarian believer, and that's, that's what I am, and, and our church namesake says that we are Trinitarian believers, we believe that there is one God in three persons. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Now, I can go ahead and tell you, as I much as I appreciate everyone and everyone's input on how they try to describe and bring some understanding to the Trinity, let me go ahead and tell you, human words and human descriptions are wholly inadequate to describe the Trinity. It is a divine revelation that I just don't believe the human mind can fully comprehend. Now, I have a basic understanding but I, I would be lying to you if I told you I had perfect understanding of how there can be one God with three individuals in it, all of them different but the same. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, now where I believe in the Trinity, I do not even attempt to try and explain it in a way because if I do, it will be inadequate and leave you wanting. So what I'm going to tell you is when I start talking about the Trinity, I'm talking to you about the Trinity by faith. It is, one of those, it is one of those scriptural mysteries, I guess you could say, that you're just going to have to trust God. And, and, and so when I say that, I, I say that, look, here, when I start talking about the Trinity, here's all you need to know about what I believe about the Trinity. Number one, the, my Father in heaven is the creator. And the Son, Jesus Christ, is my Savior. And the Holy Ghost, the third person of the Trinity, is my comforter. Amen. Amen. And that is really what Jesus says here. He says, look, there is, this, there is a divine direction on how things go around here. God has directed me. He has given me a definitive order on how to do things. You see, the, the, the Trinity is unified in all things. They are unified in their character. They are unified in essence. The only thing that differs is function. And Jesus tells us this divine direction. The Father sent me to you. You see, when you begin talking to somebody and witnessing them to, about Jesus Christ, it is not error to tell them that you are on a mission from God. Huh? And that Jesus wanted me to let you know that he was sent here. For you. That is not erroneous at all. It sounds flaky and I'm good with that. But it's the truth. 
And of course, this is where I can tell you, this is why we should always be in awe of Jesus. Sent here. Came willingly. The perfect, sinless Son of God was sent for multitudes of people who would hate Him. Sent here for multitudes of people that would slander Him. Multitudes of people that would ignore him. Multitudes of people that would crucify him. And many would crucify him today if they had the chance. But here's the great part. He came anyway. You, you can find it over and over again in John or Luke 9, 48, Luke 10, 16, John 5, 23 and 24, and John 8. It says over and over again, the Lord Jesus says... I didn't come here, of my, uh, I have come because I was sent. You, if you see me, you see the one that sent me. If you hear me, you hear the one who sent me. I did not come here with my own agenda. So if you're going to say, what would Jesus do? Let me go ahead and tell you, many of you, and, and me included, need to look at our lives and ask, are we following Jesus' agenda or are we following our own? Jesus didn't follow his own agenda. He got in line with the scripture. He got in line with what the Father wanted. What did the Father want? Reconciliation of the world to himself. So he sent his son to die for us. You see, when Jesus says this, of course, it rubs even people in that crowd and people in the crowds that were here today because it speaks to the deity of Christ. They hate to hear that. There are those that hear me that, that cringe when I tell you that Jesus was God in the flesh. I mean, it sounds like, Philip, you don't understand. I have read the Old Testament that says, the Lord our God is one Lord. And I say, yes and amen. But in the very beginning of the Bible, I see that God, the Creator, spoke this world into existence. He spoke Jesus, the Word of God. And in that, we see the work of the Trinity, the, the, the Trinity, the Spirit of God, come and hover over the, the waters of the deep and bring order to disorder. We see the Trinity even in the very beginning. But, but see, there, there are those who will, who will say, well, you know, if He was... If he was truly deity, tell us what really was the purpose of his work. Well, see, I don't have to try and figure it out. That is the great thing about Jesus. I really don't have to figure anything out. Jesus says he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Simple enough. But do you know that there are people today that that, that hip preacher I was telling you all a while ago with the kid clothes on and the beard down to here? Huh? You know what he really believes? If you were to really get down deep and, and get digging in, he believes that Je Jesus' ministry was to build a following. Because that's what he does. That's why he dresses the way he does, preaches the way he does, preaches the, the methodology he does, is that he might build a following. But is that what Jesus came to this earth to do? Did he come to build a following? No. I can tell you, now people follow Jesus. People who hated him, people who loved him, people just want to see what he was going to do. There are many people that followed Jesus probably for close to three years hoping to get a little more of that free bread. Huh? Hoping, hoping I would be the next one to get a touch from the throne of grace. There are many people who follow Jesus, but that is not why he came. Matter of fact, I can tell you that Jesus rejected the following often because he did and said things that caused people to leave and not follow him. One of the greatest non-church building uh, verses in the Bible is when Jesus says, in effect, come and die. Come and die. Take up your cross. See, the cross is not a necklace you hang around your neck, man. The cross is a means of execution. You got to execute your flesh and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are many people who heard him say that and said, See you later, Jesus. I come to eat. Huh? I 
didn't come to follow a revolutionary. But there are those who, who will then say, well, Jesus uh, came to start a world religion. No, he didn't. Jesus came and operated as a Jew. Jew being his heritage. Jew being his family line of this earth. But do you realize that Judaism in and of itself is not God's religion? What? But I thought, I thought the nation of Israel practiced Judaism. No, they didn't. Judaism didn't, didn't even come about until around the time when the, the uh, follower, the, the believers, the Israelites were returned after 70 years in exile. Judaism didn't exist. See, Judaism is a transliteration of the name Judah, which was the fourth born to, to Israel. And his name means praise. Praise the Lord, Judah. Do you know what the Israelites practiced? They practiced following God's law. Judaism is man's response to God's revelation. In other words, Judaism took God's law and God's prescribed method of worship and incorporated all kinds of man-made religious things and called it Judaism. So Jew, Jesus being a Jew, he honored his heritage by living as a Jew. But he did not practice Judaism. His parents did. Okay, so that the thing is, what I'm trying to tell you is that Jesus did not come to this earth to start a religion. He didn't come to this earth to start a religious movement. Jesus did not come to start an earthly revolution. Jesus did not come to overthrow the Roman Empire. Jesus didn't come to overthrow the creditors in your life. Jesus did not come for any other reason than to seek and to save that which was lost. Paul said it is a good word worthy of all acceptation that Jesus came to die for sinners, to save sinners. Jesus said he came to seek and to save the lost and ultimately his whole point, his whole purpose in living is to point people to the one who sent him, his father, creator, Jehovah God, Elohim. He is pointing them back to the creator because he came to reconcile us to God. Why is that so hard to understand? Because we want to do it ourselves. You give me enough time and let me work hard enough and I'll keep, my, I'll keep my nose to the grindstone and at some point God will receive me. No, he won't. Anything less than the blood of Jesus is insufficient. So when we believe on Jesus, when we trust him, what we are effectively doing is putting our faith and our belief and our trust in God Almighty. What are we trusting him to do? We're trusting him to save us. We're trusting him to forgive us. We're trusting that if we come to him, that he doesn't promise to make things better. Please don't get caught up in the better mentality. Jesus did not call you to become a better person. Jesus called you to become brand new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a better Christian. That's not what it says. No, it says he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He didn't call you to be better. He called you to be brand new. Called you to be born again. See, Jesus is, is also the answer for all of those who say that they want to see God. Man, have you ever met anybody that would tell you, man, you know, look, I would believe, God, believe in God if I could see him? No, you wouldn't. You really wouldn't. But Jesus says, though, here, he, he said that if you have seen me, you've seen him that sent me. So here's the thing. Here's what I always, and what I would be a pat answer is, is if you truly want to see God, look to Jesus. Just look to Jesus. If you want to know what God looks like, if you want to know what God's character is, look to Jesus. Get in the four Gospels. New Christians, I always give them, the, or somebody who's been away from the Lord and just cannot seem to find their, their footing anymore, I tell them the same thing. Look, 
You need to read the book of John because John tells you all about Jesus. He, he, he describes the, the Lord Jesus in the way that only deity can be described. Then you read 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. That'll teach you how to live. And if you can't do any better than that, you, you get in them scriptures and stay there. Okay? But, but here's the thing. I say that because if you truly want to see God, you have to look to Jesus. You look to the person of Jesus. You look to the ministry of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus. And more than that, you have to look to the love of Jesus. You, you will not understand God until you look at the love Jesus expressed to a world that hated him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved. You see, and also in Colossians 2, 8, 9, to, to help Christians, Apostle Paul says, he, he says, beware, which means to beware. It is, it, there's nothing complicated. Beware, be cautious. Lest any man spoil you through philosophy, and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. If you want to understand and see God, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Please hear me today. Even Christians need to hear it. Look to Jesus. Stop looking all around. Look to Jesus. He is the answer today. You see in verse 46 he says, I am come a light to the world that whosoever believe on me should not abide in darkness. Let me go ahead and tell you now. The answer to darkness which is ignorance is Jesus. If you are walking in this world in darkness there, there are those who will say I just want to, I would love to understand the Bible. That's a good one. Penn Jillette has been quoted as saying that he has read the Bible through several times and he just don't get it. Penn Jillette being a, a world famous atheist, okay? He's part of a comedy crew called Penn and Jillette. Or Penn, yeah, that's right. Is that right? No, Penn and Teller. There you go. Lord help me. Hadn't seen him since I was a kid. But what he says is, is he would believe it if he could just get it. He says, I need the Rosetta Stone to help me understand this word because it makes no sense. He's in darkness. And there are many Christians today, those who have trusted Christ, who walk in darkness because they, they refuse to receive the light. And I'll go ahead and tell you like for, for Penn and for those that, even Christians who tell me, man, I just... Some of the stuff in the Bible, man, I just, I just don't get it. And I just always say, well, look, from a, from a purely carnal perspective, I do understand, right? Because I'll go ahead and tell you, from a human standpoint, some of the things that happen in the Bible are quite ridiculous. I mean, seriously ridiculous. Why do you say that? Well, first of all, if you won't believe or can't believe Genesis 1-1, let me tell you something. Believing in a talking snake ain't going to make any sense to you. Amen. Believing in a talking donkey ain't going to make any sense to you. Let me tell you something. How would you have liked to have been the prophet riding on that donkey? Mm -hmm. Huh? First of all, there's an angel right there with a sword drawn fixed to cut him asunder. Mm -hmm. Huh? Yes, sir. Oh, Balaam's rolling. He's ready to go, son. And he, Come on, girl. Let's get it. And she just stops. She sees the angel. This, this dumb ass is what the Bible says has more sense than the prophet riding on her back. Amen. Huh? And she just halts right there and says, I'm not going any further. And he kicks on her, whips on her son. And finally she just rolls over out of the way and crushes his leg against a wall. Now how silly does that sound? You telling me a dumb animal can see an angel but that prophet of God couldn't? I'm exactly what I'm saying. Then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, God in his mercy opens the mouth of that stupid animal and it says, how long have you been riding me? You have owned me forever, it seems like, and I have never done anything but obey you. Do you think I am so stupid that I would do this on purpose? Do you not see that you're fixing to die? That's my translation. So, but it's true. 
And then he's like, oh man, I'm sorry. Went to the angel and said, yeah, I'm sure glad he, you, you know what I'm saying. But doesn't that sound ridiculous from a human standpoint? Talking snakes, talking donkeys. I'll tell you another one. How silly would it be to build a boat on dry ground in the middle of the desert that's never rained? Huh? Come on, man. It's never rained, much less flooded. What do we need that for? It looks like a coffin. Huh? What about that? How about fire from heaven? I mean, have we ever experienced fire from heaven? How about bread from heaven? How about, how about walking up to the sea and all of a sudden see, a, see it begin to crack and split open and stand up on both sides? How ridiculous. You must take me for a fool. No, if you don't believe it, I take you for a fool. You see, because the answer for, for Penn and anyone who else who says they don't get it is just look to Jesus for light. What he says is if you will trust in me, if you'll be born again, he promises he will not leave you in the dark. His promise is he will illuminate it. He will make it all understandable. He will make it all believable. Because if I can believe that God spoke everything into existence out of nothing, then surely I can believe that he can make his creation speak. That's the Rosetta Stone, believe in Jesus. Now Jesus also in verse 47 says, And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. There is his divine purpose. He came to save the world. Everybody got that? That was the direction Jesus was given. But here's the thing. Uh, Jesus says, because his coming, coming to earth, is evidence that the world was judged as needing saving. Jesus could say, he didn't come to judge, and he didn't. He never, never once did Jesus get in a position that when somebody didn't believe him, that he had to pass judgment. No. And the reason is because the world in and of itself has already had judgment passed on it. We are all in need of a Savior. But I can also say that Jesus doesn't have to pass judgment because you've already judged yourself when you don't believe. You see, because Jesus' mission was salvation for any that would believe on Him, there's coming a day when they're going to stand in judgment. And they're going to be asked one question. What do you do with the Word? What you do with what you do about Jesus. Right? I know verse 48 it says, He that rejects me and rejects not my word and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. You see, there is a judge. He sits on a great white throne. And in the in the last days, everyone. Everyone in the sea, all those that have lived in the history past, those who are awaiting the, the judgment in a place called hell right now, are going to be awakened and brought back to stand before an almighty God. I always use the, the vision as naked, nothing hidden, not even your thoughts. Everyone will be judged according to their word, thought, and deed. That should be the most fearful thing. Now you say, well, well Jesus says that they're going to be judged by what he has said. You see, there are many today who are, who are just ready to be judged. And they'll, they'll, they'll use the term, only God can judge me, which should frighten you to death. Or they will say that you're giving me truth and you're judging me. No, I'm not judging you, man. I'm just giving you the truth. I'm giving you the word of God. You see, there are many today who, through just the general revelation of creation, will stand before God guilty. There are those who have lived in the United States of America where we have, well, I'm just going to say we're obese on the Word of God. We're obese on the preaching and teaching of God's Word. But look, even if you don't hear the preacher, you have the witness of creation, the witness of people around you. Everyone will be without excuse. 
There are three things that bear witness against us, and one, of, one or all three will get you. There is creation, conscience, and the Word. If all in life, the only life you get is creation and you don't respond to it, you will be judged according to that knowledge. And then conscience, because the Word of God says that the, con that, that the law was written on the heart, our conscience bearing us witness. And then there are more alive than are not who have heard enough of the Word to be saved. And that is what they will be judged accordingly. Now see, this morning, I mean, just, in, just weed this in this today. See, if you follow our, our reading plan, which if you don't have one, Claudette was gracious enough to, to make you one, so you can pick up any time you want to. You can just jump right on in. Today, we ended with Joshua chapter 1, but I, I believe it's in Deuteronomy chapter 33. It may not be 33. But there is this, there's this passage of Scripture that, of course, goes along with what we're preaching today. And it says, in verse 35, it says, To me belongs vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and all things shall come upon them. Make haste. It says, For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself of his servants, when he seeth that their power is gone, as there is none shut up or left. And then this is where Jonathan Edwards took his scripture when he preached the sermon, Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. He says their foot shall slide in due time. You see, we, we have raised up generation after generation of people who are prepared for judgment. Because they refuse to receive the good news of Jesus Christ. Verse 49 says, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment. What I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Jesus now describes that divine direction again. He says, I was sent. And I was given commandment. In other words, I have come here and everything that I have said, everything that I've taught, everything that he has told me to speak, in other words, everything that he has told me to preach, I have done. You see, and everything that I do, everything that I say, everything that I teach, everything that I preach is towards life. Jesus came not with a message of judgment, not with a message of death, but rather what? The message of life everlasting. John 3.16 should, should ever resonate in our ears. He says we read through the, the I am's. The appeals come from God who is longing people. Calling all men everywhere to repent. Calling all men everywhere to trust. Be born again hopes to reconcile this sin sick world bring us into a relationship with him where you stand this morning I said tell tell pop I guess that means I'm done amen let's pray together father I thank you today I just I thank that we can be in your house Lord I just appreciate your word Lord, and I pray that there, there would be nobody that would hear this message today and that they would not be saved. Lord, and those that, that are saved, I pray that you would use to encourage and empower them to stir their hearts today, that they would uh, become a greater witness for Christ. And Lord, I just pray today that you would come and minister to each one. Lord, help us to, to walk in the grace and the mercy of God. In Jesus' name.